Right, it is time. The moment has come. This is a long awaited late video. How historically accurate is the movie Mary Queen of Scots? Oh boy, do I have feelings. I made a video a few weeks ago, two months ago, about the film The Favourite and its treatment of Queen Anne, who was the English and then British Queen between 1702 and 1714. I mentioned at the end of that video to let me know which film you'd like me to review next and said I would do Mary Queen of Scots and then promptly forgot. But we're here now! I am ready to get my history geek on. Ahem. For the... Okay, no, that's... that's... Wow. Ugh. Jesus, no, no, no glasses, no. Okay, no, that was a bad idea. I should get glasses with fake glass in and then I can just look suitably history professorish for these videos. Professorish? Professorish. Mm. Subscribe if you enjoy history, lesbians, disability awareness, and vintage fashion with a comedic twist to everything because I honestly struggle to stay serious. Also click the bell to get notifications and please do take a look at my little merch shelf down below or through the link in the description. It's adorable, see here. Much like looking at the life of Queen Anne, that gorgeous disabled lesbian played by the wonderful Olivia Colman, the life of Mary Queen of Scots seems quite personal to me. I because I'm very obsessed with Philippa Gregory's historical novels and found the one concerning Mary very interesting. So it but it kind of differed from what we've been taught about her in school, and I thus started to dig deeper and begin researching into her life and her relationships, particularly that with Elizabeth I, the Queen of England, who was her second cousin. But before we get into the film, there's a dog coming to sit on my lap. Hi. Before we get into the film, let's begin with a little history lesson. It's a big history lesson. If you're English, you've most definitely heard of the Tudors, because all school teachers are apparently obsessed with them. So much so that you spend years and years learning about this one very specific royal family to the extent that we know more about their family dramas than we do our own. The Tudor dynasty, actually I'm not I'm not calling them a dynasty, they don't deserve that. Don't at me. The royal family began with a man called Henry Tudor, killed the English king and decided, thanks to his incredibly tenuous link to the crown, his grandmother had been the queen's wife, but his grandfather was actually a glorified servant who she ran off with after she was widowed, and his mother descended from an illegitimate grandson of a former king, so... Sure, Henry. Sure. Also, you definitely didn't have the poor princes in the tower killed. Ugh, so over Henry Tudor. Anyway, he sucked as a person and as a king. He also forced the rightful but female heir to the throne, the beautiful granddaughter of my favourite historical figure, Jaquetra of Luxembourg, into marriage by coercing her into having sex with him until she was pregnant and then didn't even properly crown her until he was sure that the baby boy was actually going to make it into childhood. Oh. Apparently he told her if she didn't have a baby boy with him, he was going to try and force a son on her younger sisters, who were all children. Delightful. Delightful man. They had four children, Arthur, who was great, Margaret, who was less great, Henry, who was not at all great, and Mary, who was cute and I'm never going to mention again. Don't write that on your history exam, okay? This video is not a verified reference document. Sadly, Arthur, who would have been a great king because he was a refined, courageous young man and clearly got all the best bits from his mother's side, died as a teenager not long after marrying the spare as Princess Catalina of Aragon, also known as Catherine. Uh, remember that face. She'll be back. Margaret, the second child, is important too. At the age of 14, she was married to the King of Scotland, James IV, and sent up north as essentially a, a peace treaty of a person. The hope was that she would have many, many babies who would securely tie the Kingdom of Scotland and England, and thus ensure that the Scottish would stop raiding the north of England and trying to start a war. I mean, good luck with that. Surely you're just giving the Scottish more reason to invade England? Now they have a claim to that throne too? But. Sure. Unfortunately, she wasn't the brightest spark and continually angered the Scottish lords by making stupid decisions with men, much like we'll see her granddaughter do in a minute. Margaret and James had, by all accounts, a very good marriage and produced six children, although only one actually survived infancy and later became James V at the age of 17 months, when his father was killed by the English. Margaret then attempted to act as regent for her son, the baby king, but faced more than a bit of opposition from the Scottish lords who were, um, not best pleased by women having power, especially an English woman, especially then they were part of an alliance with the French against the English. Uh, see, I told you that whole princess's peace treaty thing wouldn't work out. It didn't. Margaret is considered to have acted calmly and with some degree of political skill. By July 1514, she'd even managed to reconcile the contending parties and Scotland, along with France, concluded peace with England that very same month. Good job, Margaret! Way! Oh, but then she ruined it. Unfortunately, she was seduced by the Earl of Angus, who was 
insert rude word here, and according to his own uncle, a young witless fool. Apparently, he was a magnetic presence who swayed Margaret into giving too much to his own family and thus angered the other lords, turned against him, and wow, was that a drama. Essentially, she started a civil war and then she ran away back to England, leaving her children behind. Well done. So poor James V was the baby king and he had to grow up fast. But hopping back to England quickly. Okay. With Margaret's older brother, Arthur, dead, her younger brother, Henry, had become king. King Henry VIII. To start with, he was young, charming, handsome, the dream king, and he even married his brother's poor widow who had been bitterly neglected and abused by their father. Apparently because he actually wanted to marry her, and then she said no, because no. Everything was great, except Henry and Catherine really struggled to have children. Only one, Mary, survived babyhood, and after 24 years together, he divorced her in order to marry her maiden-waiting, Anne Boleyn. Please note we are speeding through history here. There were many other terrible things that that happened surrounding this marriage breakup and the way Catherine was treated. <sighs> Including Henry changing the religion of the entire country just so that he could say that he was now head of the church and he could marry whomever he wanted. These Henrys. Despite the drama and shifting poor Catherine, Henry didn't even keep his interest in Anne up and when she only gave him a daughter but no sons in the three years, he essentially invented a reason to chop off her head. Three years, he gave her three years to have a son and then he chopped off her head. <sighs> the one daughter they did produce is very important to our story, however, as she would grow up to be Elizabeth I, Queen of England, as played by Margot Robbie in the film in question. But okay, just to condense history in this ridiculous family dynamic a little more, Henry then married Anne's lady-in-waiting, Jane Seymour, who died giving birth to that son Henry had wanted so much. Not that he cared, apparently, he just had a feast and then didn't even go to see her as she lay dying and asking for him. Ugh. He then went on to marry three more women, uh, divorced, beheaded, and arrested in that order, but the last one was fortunately able to survive him, so go her. Once Henry had died, the crown then went to his son, who died young, his oldest daughter, who died without children, and then finally just Elizabeth she was the only one left. Oh yeah, and the entire religion of the country changed with every new monarch, which left many people dead and absolutely everyone confused. Also, no one could decide whether Elizabeth was legitimate or not, because maybe Henry had actually illegally divorced his first wife, and like, see, I told you, those Tudors, all they do is ruin things. So Elizabeth I finally has her crown. Excellent. But what's happening back in Scotland? Well, you remember that her cousin James V is on the throne, right? Became king at 17 months old. Well, firstly, he had a pretty horrible childhood, since despite being king, all of the adults in his life basically just used him as a pawn, including his aforementioned terrible stepfather, who held him prisoner for three years and ruled in his place. I mean, okay, don't worry though, James eventually escaped and then banished his entire step family. Go, James. He married twice both to French princesses, ish, and tried to strengthen the ties there as his godfather was the king of France. France and Scotland kind of had a thing. It's like, largely because they both hated the English. I mean, it was like a revenge coupling, really. You'll see more about that. His first wife, Madeleine, had been very sickly since birth, and her father, the king of France, was not best pleased at the thought of his frail 16-year-old getting married, but couldn't really say no to James, since there was a treaty that promised him a French princess, and... Oh, what do you know she died? Six months into marriage. This is why you pay attention to people's health complaints. Anyway, less than a year later, he had a new wife, Mary de Guise, who was a widow with two sons already, so everyone assumed she'd be more robust. The union produced two sons, however, both died in infancy. Scotland is really cold. Then, in 1542, in short succession, war broke out with England, Marie gave birth to a baby Mary, and King James died. Meaning, as the only legitimate child of James V, Mary, Queen of Scots, took her throne at just six days old. Six. Notice I said legitimate. He had a lot of legitimate ones. Nine, in fact. Three of whom were fathered before he was 20, and one of whom we're going to hear about more later. I love how gossipy these videos are. So fun. Okay, you've probably got this far in and you're thinking, Jessica, when are you actually going to start talking about the damn movie? But this is all very important background knowledge, okay? You need it. Although, let's be honest, I think you know the answer to the question in the title already. How historically accurate is Mary, Queen of Scots? No, no. Firstly, and this for me was very important, Mary was sent to France at the age of five because she was engaged to the heir of the French throne, so she lived in the French court for 13 years. She was the favourite of the King of France, over his own children even. But she did not have a Scottish accent. No. According to contemporary accounts, Mary was beautiful, lively, clever, and spoke French, Italian, Latin, Spanish, Greek, and a bit of Scots. But she did not speak English. Her limited ability to communicate with the Scottish lords was probably 
probably the root of most of her problems. That and being a woman, because misogyny. As the film portrays, she was indeed very beautiful, with auburn hair and quite tall. Her adult height was 5 foot 11 inches, which is like... 1.8 metres, which is even taller than me. Mary was brought up in the knowledge that she was not only the Queen of Scotland, but was also destined to become the Queen of France and the Queen of England, as most Catholics believed Elizabeth was not the rightful heir to the throne due to being both Protestant and iffy on the legitimacy thing. She believed, as the entire French court did, in the divine right of kings, that a king is chosen by God and therefore cannot be wrong and isn't even really a human, but is instead a heavenly presence on earth which would have all been fine, except that her husband became king and just up and died. Ah, so she didn't que get to be Queen of France for a bit, but not much. Widowed, Mary returned to Scotland and claimed the throne she did have and struggled to govern her unruly kingdom since female monarchs are kind of the devil in their eyes. The next part's covered by the film. Spoilers! Elizabeth, the unmarried, childless, 28-year-old Queen of England, is unnerved by Mary's claim to her throne. So she decides the best thing to do is marry Mary off to an Englishman, meaning the future King of Scotland will be half English. Also Protestant, hopefully for Elizabeth. Elizabeth chooses Robert Dudley, a disgraced nobleman who she secretly loves, to propose to Mary. Weird choice. Both are unwilling to be married to each other, but then Elizabeth develops smallpox and Mary sees her chance, because agrees to take the offer provided that Mary is named Elizabeth's heir apparent, but Elizabeth's then like reluctant to let go of Dudley and it doesn't die, so secretly sends Lord Darnley to Scotland. Cue English Lord's face palming. Lord Darnley is a cousin of both queens, so by marrying him, Mary is just strengthening her claim to the throne of England? Didn't think that through. In Scotland, Mary's council is suspicious of Darnley as they fear an English takeover. Both kingdoms demand he return to England immediately, but Mary refuses and marries him, only to discover him in bed with her friend and private secretary, David Rizzio, the following morning. Cue more face palming. Mary decides to quash the rebels who hate her husband, but demands that Darnley give her a child. Once a child is conceived, Mary declares that the child is the heir apparent to Scotland and England, which deeply offends the English. Unsurprisingly, Mary's half-brother, who is pretty sure he should be the king because he's a man, never mind that he's illegitimate, concludes with pretty much everyone to spread rumours that Mary was adulterous and her child was illegitimately fathered by Rizzio, which, meh, who, gay, but... Sure. Fearing the accusations against Mary and the discovery of his own homosexuality, Darnley is coerced by the baddies to join them in murdering Rizzio and reluctantly delivers the final blow. He is the worst. I mean, okay, not the worst. He's not a Tudor, but he still sucks. Mary agrees to pardon the men involved, provided she's presented with evidence that Darnley had taken part. She ultimately forgives her half-brother and asks Elizabeth to be her child's godmother. Together, they agree that baby James is heir presumptive to both countries, which the English hate. Mary banishes her husband Darnley, but refuses to divorce him since she's Catholic. Oh, but apparently God doesn't say anything against murdering husbands, so she just asks her advisor and protector, the Earl of Bothwell, to have him killed. Unsurprisingly, much drama abounds. Mary is forced to flee and leave baby James behind. The following morning, Bothwell tells her that the council have decided that she marry a Scotsman, him, immediately, which she agrees to. The country then believes that she is a harlot who had her husband killed to marry another man. Well done. Despite furiously objecting to it, Mary eventually abdicates her throne and flees to England. Elizabeth arranges for a clandestine meeting with her, where Mary asks for Elizabeth's help to take back her throne and insults her a bit. Elizabeth won't go to war on behalf of a Catholic, but instead promises safe exile in England as long as Mary does not aid her enemies. Seems reasonable. Unfortunately, Mary only ever looks a gift horse in the mouth, so gets lippy, and Elizabeth orders she be placed under house arrest in England. She then spends years and years and years going back and forth on whether or not she should just execute Mary and be done with it. Mm. The film rather speeds over this though, and eventually, when presented with compelling evidence that Mary has conspired with her enemies to have Elizabeth assassinated, Elizabeth just orders Mary's execution, and then cries for Mary as she walks onto the scaffold, only for Mary to throw off her cloak and reveal a bright red dress, implying that she is a martyr. And here we come to the breakdown of the film. Fact or fiction? Spoilers, obviously. One, Mary's Scottishness. I just 
No. That girl was French before she was anything else. There are some letters that describe her Scottish accent, but they weren't written by Scottish people, so there may have been some confusion. It's generally just believed she sounded French. Two. Mary and Elizabeth did not meet face to face to hash out the dramas and attempt to resolve the war. I mean, they never even met. Never. Although they sent many letters to each other, occasionally moaning about how they hadn't met yet. Interestingly, Elizabeth's letters to her fellow queen are very... romantic. Three. The gay thing. Not the lesbian undertones. The other gay thing. The man thing. Debatable. I mentioned this in my review of The Favourite, but it's actually really, really hard to know for sure if people in history were gay, unless they wrote it down themselves, since it's not like there is the telltale sign of pregnancy. 4. Dudley and Mary did not meet, as the film shows, when he offered his hand in marriage to her, instead much later once she was already in captivity. 5. Mary did think of Elizabeth as her inferior. After all, Elizabeth had been declared illegitimate at two and a half years old, and no one ever actually reversed that act. She was also the wrong religion, according to Mary. They weren't friends who became enemies, they were just enemies from birth. Six. The film's taglines are Born to Fight for Mary and Born to Rule for Elizabeth, which is a complete role reversal. No. Just no. Mary was raised knowing she would eventually be queen of three countries. Elizabeth was raised with half the country questioning the legitimacy of her parents' marriage, and the other half sure her father was not her father. Seven. The film portrays Mary as refusing to abdicate her throne in a confrontation between herself and her husband Bothwell, with her treacherous brother James Stuart, Earl of Moray, and scheming advisor Lord Maitland. In real life, Mary did sign away her throne, likely out of coercion and threatening. But after escaping her enemy's clutches, she immediately sought out an army to reclaim her throne. So this is kind of right, kind of wrong. Eight. Elizabeth Scars. Poor Margot Robbie, okay? The film startled her with a heavy prosthetic nose and pock marks, and it's the least glamorous cinematic interpretation of Elizabeth I ever. It's very weird though, as despite this kind of seeming bid for authenticity, no other character, not even extra, has anywhere near as grizzled a face as Elizabeth, making her this weird anomaly. Nine. This is semi shown in the film, but. Bothwell was an abhorrent human being who kidnapped and raped Queen Mary, but due to her belief in the sacred body of a monarch, once it was obvious she'd been abused in such a way, because she became pregnant with twins, she had to say it was her choice and thus protect the sanctity of her person. He then fled to exile in Denmark and didn't help her when she begged him to. 10. This one's really interesting. It's often debated in the film world, so let me know what you think. Director Josie Rourke told the LA Times, I was really clear I would not direct an all-white period drama. And as such, the film portrays the English ambassador to the Scottish court, Lord Thomas Randolph, as a black man, and Elizabeth Hardwick as being of Chinese ancestry. 11. This is a really tiny issue, but they kept calling Mary Queen of Scotland, but that's inaccurate, since the monarchy in Scotland ruled the people, not the land, because no one is ruling the highlands. Have you seen the place? Good luck. 12. In the final scenes of the film, Mary thinks very kindly of her son James, King of the Scots, who later becomes King of England. In reality, by this point, Mary was entirely disillusioned with her son James after he cut off contact with her and pursued his own treaties and policies with Elizabeth without consulting or caring for his mother in her captivity. She wrote to her French relatives and expressed her broken-hearted disappointment in him. 13. And finally, the timeline's just really off. She was in prison for 18 years and the film just jumps over it. Mary was placed in the custody of the Earl of Shrewsbury and his wife, Bess of Hardwick, in 1569 and moved around to various residences of the couple at their own cost. My final opinion of the film. It's one of those classic, epic costume dramas that I love so much. But I do feel that the historical inaccuracy is kind of wrinkled so much that I'm not sure I'd watch it again. I just kept watching and thinking, no, it's not right. No, it didn't happen like that. No. It was very annoying. If I hadn't known these things, I think it's a film that I would return to and watch again and again. Sadly, now you've seen this video, I've probably ruined it for you too, so yay! At least we're in the same boat. What did you think of the film? If you haven't seen it but somehow have made it to the end of this video, Congratulations. Would you watch it now? Let me know in the comments what you thought and which historical film you'd like me to ruin next. Please remember to like this video and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you in the next one. Mwah.